So World Foundation model is literally having the AI understand the world, right? And so in a physical AI scenario, that makes you know, it very important that it knows physics as well as what the world is, right? And so when you do a standard diffusion model and you're just generating an image and you get a happy dog in a space suit, that's not really what we're after here, right? We're after a world model that actually understands what's happening in the physical world, what would actually happen if that dog was sitting here in this chair, would he fall over if I pushed him, all those sorts of things. And then the reason we call it a world model is because it literally has to be able to handle the world, right? So if we're talking about robots that are working wherever they're going to be, their context is really what the world is. So of course, if you're talking about physical AI, physics matters, right? So friction and gravity and Newton's laws, all these sorts of things are important. It's pretty obvious when you say physics. But more important are the other stuff that are, like at this pen, if I do this and bring it back, it's still here. And it's actually the same rotation here, right? So this up is the same vector. And it doesn't magically do this, suddenly, right? And so, or I don't have multiple fingers up here, right? Like, so object permanence is where an object can disappear and come back, or the actual camera can move and come back, and that object is exactly where it should be, right? So if I turn, this building would stay where it is. So it's a bit like, because uh, I've seen some of those gen AI of kind of horses where the, the legs kind of swap sides and things like that. So that's kind of looking at fixing those problems, right? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Obviously, the, not just the horse's legs going funny, but also the horse's gait is important, right? If you move it forwards and backwards, then we get into temporal, sti temporal stability, right? So having something work across time matters. But yeah, obviously, in an object permanence standpoint, if the horse's legs go behind each other, that leg is still there. Did you, you basically just have to throw a lot of compute to make these work, or is it smarter than that? Well, ideally, you don't. Right? And so the whole point of building the models is, of course, to first simulate the world and be able to re replicate wherever we're going to be. But then we would go through the standard distillation modes and try to get it to work on multiple GPUs. And so actually the, the models that we've been working on do work across different levels of GPUs, but the, you just have to wait longer depending on how much compute you have. Right? And so we're doing a bunch of work in the future around optimizations and how to deploy it across different GPUs because if you're on a great big GB200, it's fantastic. You can inference very quickly. But what if I'm down on a Jetson on a forklift? It's only a five watt draw. It's gotta be very small for that reason. Little power going into it, but also the amount of compute it can do is also very little, right? So you wanna have a model that can work across all of these that's where it gets really tricky. I've seen some of the promotional videos around this and there's lots of um, imagery of kind of factory floor, for instance, you mentioned Fort Lift, you know, driving around. Is it about the look of it as well or is that just a, a way of visualizing it for us humans? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So when we first start talking about World Foundation models and we did, people didn't really understand it until we gave them a video of what the model sees, right? And so our first output is a video. It makes sense because human understands it, right? But some of the model training you go through, I've seen it, where people just have the, maybe it's doing a human gait analysis and the person does this weird spasm mode and their arm goes, but what the, across all those frames, what it's realized is that my elbow can only go here, it can't go further, that would break my arm. It's figured out all this stuff that makes sense to the AI, very in a compact way, if you will, but to a human, it looks, looks crazy, right? And so that's where it gets really tricky where World Foundation models, we're showing a video, so people think it's just making videos. But it's not actually what it's doing, it's building a world that we can actually do a viewpoint in, right? And so one of the examples we showed at CES, and we, we show again here at, at GTC, was we would actually have a camera driving from a car and then have the actual viewpoints from different mirrors, right? So some are looking out to the right, maybe 45 back, depending on how your actual car is set up. So we, in our model, set it up for six cameras, front, back, couple from the mirrors, but the truck that was driving alongside that camera is the same truck. So depending on what angle we see is what you see, whether it's the front or the back of this lorry, right? But the world model knows that there's a truck there. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of, I, I, I can't help but think of things like games that have been built in Unity and things like this. So how does it differ from, say, a 3D space like that that somebody's built to I don't know, run around as Spider-Man or whatever. Yeah. Well, there's no, no A, A, B, B <laughs> cheat codes, first of oh. all. <laughs> but oh, yeah, I mean, it, in a lot of ways, 3D computer graphics are the same, right? So it's premises of like up, down, left, right, movement, that sort of thing, occlusions, 
are all kind of very similar, right? But the big difference for us here is we're trying to have this AI predict the future of physics and what's about to happen, right? And so in this case, with that truck's driving by, it knows if there's a, a crack in the road that it sees, it'll have a bump to the truck, right? Or in some of the scenarios, we, we actually were playing with the, the road in front of the conference center here as just a demo test. And we started messing to see like, what if we made it like uh, Last of Us is a computer game example, right? Where we had like a bunch of jungle and stuff in the roads and the car actually knew to move around the road depending on where it was bumpy and stuff, right? And so if that was a computer game, we'd actually have to program the actual pathing logic to say, okay, when you see this thing, and, oh, and here's a map to say that the road's broken and oh, sample it here. And when you get to point two, your threshold says avoid all this logic that AI is kind of baked into the model itself. So rather than having kind of rules and spaghetti code, you've got kind of nodes firing somewhere in a deep network. Yeah. Okay. Which is pretty, pretty crazy. It is pretty crazy. So where's the AI kind of working there then? Is it on an agent model? As in, is it an overview of the whole, is the whole world being kind of run or have you got specific kind of agents in the different parts of the world? Yeah, so it is, oh, that's why it's called a world model. It's building the world, right? And then we get inputs into it. So the other thing we've got uh, is one of the examples we have is Cosmos Transfer where you can give different inputs and then get different outputs out, right? And so in that case, you could give an input of uh, control of LiDAR, for instance, but the world model would look at that and then say, oh, I don't understand, and it would construct the world based on that LiDAR input and then sh send out the video for you. Is that a training thing or is that actual LiDAR in the real world that you then... Yeah, or both, right? So the reason we built all of this is probably where we should have started, right? Rather than just diving right into it's coming around to what's it for? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Go, yeah, yeah. Go, go so go. normally we say, well, "Why are you doing this?" <laughs> <laughs> so we we call it the three computer pr problem, right? So the very first thing you want to do if you're building an AI is to train a model, right? So you've got training that goes on, but in order to do that, you need to have data to train it, right? And so you could have pre-training, and then you need data coming in. So we'll just say data over here, and we'll just draw a big box. Right? And the whole idea is once you've got the data coming into the train, then you would build the, your model and you would give it to the robot. So in this case, we'll, we'll just say the physical robot that's going to run that model, but it's going to hit problems. And it's going to say, oh, I don't really understand that your gripper doesn't look right. So we need to do post-training on top of that. Right? So we've got pre and post-training for the models. So we actually have a whole computer to do this sort of calculation. And the robot says, give me a post-training, but in order to do that, you're going to need more data. So you can either record the data physically with the camera as we're doing right now, or you can make synthetic data, right? So you could either have physical data or synthetic data. And this is why we built Cosmos to help with the synthetic data problem, right? Because if we've got, let's say we've got a car, we're driving down the road. And actually this, this is a rare example that actually literally happened to me the other day. So I'm driving down the road through a school zone, driving fairly slowly, and all of a sudden this mom comes running right down the road, right down the middle of the road, past me. And I, what is happening? And so I slowed right down, she ran by me. So I stopped the car, because there's clearly a reason that it's going on, and a bear runs across the road and down. So it literally crossed and down. Now, if I was at this kind of thing, and I've got my car that saw a bear, and I know what a bear is, what are the chances I also know what a woman running down the road is, if she's got a purse, that I should probably stop because it's about to happen. All these sorts of things are pretty hard to do. But then on top of that, what if it's foggy? And what if it's nighttime? And what if one of my headlights is out? Will I still recognize the woman with the bear? And this is where synthetic data can really help, where I could take that real camera that I have on my dash camera and then extend it to be nighttime, raining. Maybe it's raining in winter with a bit of snow and slush, right? And build a whole bunch of different scenarios to then feed in, right? So the robot has asked for different scenarios. We do post-training and we give it back to the car in this case, which is our robot. So the next time it sees a woman running down the road with the bear at night in the fog, it actually already knows what to do. And so at what point is that happening then? Is that happening constantly? Is that a thing that you do before you set the robot on the road? Tell me about that. Yeah, so the challenge really is the, the ability of what the robot can do, right? So all of this compute takes power. And so it really depends on how much power and GPU and, and compute you can actually do in the robot, right? And so probably you need to do more bigger models in the actual cloud where you have the space and time and ability to do that. And then you need to distill it down to a smaller model, the whole student teacher idea where one model could be fast and, and quite small 
as a student and the teacher model in the cloud here could be much bigger, do all the compute and then it would teach the other one and it eventually gets to a point where this car can do as well as this one in those scenarios. So it's kind of like distill that information down into yep, what, what's that's needed. Right. Yeah, and also reject stuff it doesn't need, right? I was because, going to say, what is lost in that process? Yeah. Because presumably there's stuff that, you know, I mean, I'm guessing hopefully it's not relevant. But. Yeah, well, and that's the real tricky part, right? Like, if I wanted to train on every single different type of bear, for instance, and now I know Grizzly and Kodiak and Black, and do I need to know all the bears in North America or South America or Asia? Like, and so you have to start making these choices, right? And so... Uh, one example I've got is a security camera in my garage that's just doing object detection, where I've trained it to understand what a, what a FedEx truck is and what a purulator and what it, but you might not need that in a different scenario, right? Or in, where I live, I live in Vancouver in a mountain, so I want to also know what a cougar, a mountain lion looks like. Uh, and so that might not even make sense if I'm in Arizona where there are mountain lions. Well, if people do want to go and have a try of this, you've mentioned it's out there. Is it, is it open source there? Yeah, so we've put out NVIDIA Cosmos open source, so you can get it on an open model license, and you can both choose to, as we said here, like do your own post-training if you want, or we have customers actually doing early access managed service where we're helping them. The idea would be first figure out what the problem is you're trying to solve, and then decide whether the, the base model is already good enough or you need to post-train because you've got a specific scenario, uh, and then you can start figuring out what pieces you need to do. So if you do need to do post-training, you're probably gonna have to do video curation and select more models. Uh, for our cars, for instance, we took 16,000 hours of specific car models to get a better result for our specific cameras, right? So it's not small amounts of data, it's not two images. It's, so you want to put some thought into your plan of what you're trying to do. Is it quite hardware intensive to run this? Do you, what do you need? Would a gaming machine do it, for instance? Uh, right now, the models are pretty hardware intensive. You could get away with a, a pretty good gaming GPU, and it really just comes down to how long you want to wait. And so if you want to wait a couple of seconds, you want a GB200, right? It's a massive machine that can, the throughput is just phenomenal. It's built for this. But if you're willing to wait a couple hours, you could probably run on a much older, smaller gaming GPU, right? And it just becomes your, your pain threshold of how long do I want to wait to see my results? This is the CUDA driver stack, and this is the CUDA libraries and their APIs and SDKs and frameworks and all sorts of things on there. And they combine together to make a system where whatever your program is, you've probably got the right thing for the job. And is there like a Hello World in CUDA? Or could you write Hello World in CUDA? Is there an equivalent?